It's um, so good to be with you all. And I'm really excited to, to, to be here. Um, you know, I, I, sometimes you get to go places and, and you've got this really polished together word. And it's just great. And sometimes you get to go places and you're like, okay, I've got bits of a jigsaw, but I know they're really strategic. And I know that God wants to do something with them. And so today, <laughs> you'll be excited to know I've come with bits of a jigsaw. <laughs> And I'm not even sure exactly how it's all going to go. I mean, I was giving some slides here to Duncan. I'm saying, Duncan, we might use this one, and we might use that one, and we might use that one. And there's a wee video over there, and we might use that. So, Holy Spirit, I just thank you that you're here. <laughs> and I thank you that you have some Rima things to just drop in our spirits. God, you brought us here today because you, you've, you're already meeting with us, but you want to change us in that meeting. And you want us to go out of here more on fire for you and more in love with you than we've ever been. So Holy Spirit, will you just fill us up afresh and just direct the rest of this morning <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought what I might do um, is start off by showing you some, a wee, a wee update really of what's been happening in Trun because as well as doing Light and Life, uh, Colin and I lead a wee church called The River. Uh, on the west coast, uh, about an hour's drive from here. And um, we started in, in our home about two years ago, and there was about six, six of us there at that time. Um, but people, we, we never advertised, but people kept hearing that there was this thing going on where you could turn up and God was there and, and God would touch them and they'd get healed and whatever. And so they kept coming. These people just kept turn, turning up at our door. So it got to the point where we we had to open up our conservatory. That we're overflowing to the conservatory and we're overflowing to the garden, and it just got ridiculous because there was and the neighbours were complaining, <laughs> all these cars and well, drunken people, but in the spirit, leaving them late at night. Um, so, so we we moved out of our front room and we now meet in this place called Seagulls Cafe, and that's a little picture of what it looks like um, from the outside. And you know, it's just a few minutes walk from the beach, so we thought we're going to keep the beach theme. And uh, so any child who comes along gets free ice cream. Isn't that cool? Wow. And, and some Sundays, because the adults get a wee bit petulant about it, some Sundays we have ice cream Sunday, <laughs> where, where the adults can come along and get free ice cream too. And because we're close to the beach, our kids often have their God encounters in the sand. In fact, two weeks ago, our youth leader took them all down to the beach. It was one of those few moments in the summer where it wasn't raining. <laughs> and uh, they went down to the beach and they got to build sandcastles. And the whole, the whole idea of it was they were to ask the Holy Spirit what he wanted to say to them through the structure that they built. And some of the things these wee guys came back with was absolutely mind-blowing. I've got something written down here. And this little boy came back and he said... Um, I built a, a sandcastle and I, I felt to put walls around it because God said that he's my protector. Isn't that cool? Another one, um, a little girl this time came back and she said, God just told me that he's got somewhere special for me. Just like I've got this special sandcastle. And then the third one, and this, this, is really, this really got me. Um, this was a, a young um, guy just in the first year. He came back and he said, God told me that, okay, I've got the castle, but he's sending me out to take the beach. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I've got another I've got another wee photograph there if you've got the second one there that's what it looks like inside you can see there's murals on the wall and it's, there's toys everywhere so if you're one of these people that gets bored and needs to fidget come along to the river and find some Lego or whatever um, because it's just so, so child friendly and um, as we've been meeting there uh, God's just been turning up every single time, and we're beginning to develop this, this culture of healing. And so, not only do our guys turn up, but some of the people from the other churches in the area sneak in, because <laughs> they've heard that God heals. And so, we have this dilemma now that we've been there for, I think, about three or four months, and actually, we've kind of outgrown it, which is a bit sad. So, we either put a barrier on the door and say, friends and family only, or, or we just sort of seek the Holy Spirit and say, we're next. So I just want to thank you because I know so many of you are, are praying for us and supporting us in that we venture and in Teresa and, and B and, and Keith have been around, you know, a few times. And, and it's just so great to have that support. But you need to know that, that, that God's, God's taken what you're investing and he's doing something really special. So thank you. And you need to know that hope is bigger than here. Your, your, your influence is bigger than your, your meeting place. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. 
So if, you, if you're free on a Sunday night and you fancy just a wee bit of Jesus and sand or a wee bit of ice cream and maybe a beach barbecue, <laughs> you can find us in Seagulls. <laughs> cool. As I was sort of praying, uh, one of the bits of the jigsaw that I felt God give me for today, um, I'm going to call it coming out of the twilight zone, okay? Um, so before I start, because I'm talking about jigsaws, can you just turn to a neighbor and say, declare over them, you are exactly the right size and shape to be used mightily by God. Which is really encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> Depending on what size or shape you are, it's really, really encouraging. But you know, for, for centuries... Um, The church in this nation has operated in a strange twilight zone where the term Christian has become associated with being nice. Do you know? Yeah, we can laugh at that. Um, Having good morals and being well behaved and not swearing and keeping the commandments and living a good lifestyle to the point where it's not unusual now to hear people say he's not a believer, but he's more Christian than most Christians I know. You ever heard that? Yeah. Yeah. And and yet that's crazy, because Christian doesn't mean nice person. It it means little Christ one, a little anointed one. It actually means little on fire person as well. It's another translation. And, And the anointed one, Jesus, didn't live a nice lifestyle. He was a radical, supernatural being who turned the world upside down. He challenged the status quo. He annoyed people. And he did outrageous things. And he loved people outrageously. He walked on water. He turned water into wine. He sent demons into pigs. I'm not sure I want to try that one. He he loved the unlovable. He set people free. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He conquered the power of sin and death forever and ever and ever. And at this point, you can get excited because he's, he's kind of cool. But Jesus is, was and is an incredible, supernatural, radical being guess what? Every single one of us is called to be an incredible, supernatural, radical being too. We are not here to be nice. We're here to change the world. So where on earth did the concept of church being a nice, safe place full of nice, well-mannered individuals ever come from? But you know what? Somewhere down through the centuries, heaven's blueprint for a radical, supernatural church got domesticated. Uh, Yeah. And and as that, that blueprint got domesticated, the raw power and authority that we were actually created to carry and release got diluted. And you know what? It's so much time right now it's so much the time that we got it back. Any amens? Amen. <laughs> and thankfully, we live in days where the breath of God <laughs> has been released afresh and he's restoring back to the church the original blueprint. And that is so exciting. It really is. So every single one of us today has a personal invitation to leave that twilight zone behind. So turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not going to be nice anymore. You know, the only place that nice should actually be seen is on biscuits, okay? Now, I'm not telling you you should all start behaving like jerks, right? I'm really not. Um, But what I am saying is that we are so much called, we are called to be so much more than just nice. Romans 8, 19 says, all creation... All creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Not just other people. All creation. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Because when we start to grasp who we really are, and we start to to walk in our true identity, then we become people who turn the world upside down. 
just like the early church did. We become a people who, war, who wage war on sickness, who wage war on oppression, who wage war on injustice, and who replace the culture of this world with the culture of heaven. So turn to your neighbor and say, I am a powerful, supernatural, radical being. And here's another one. Declare after me, I am a changer of cultures. Come on. Say that again. I am a changer of cultures. Wherever you've been placed, if you're in a situation where it's not a good atmosphere, you don't need to be like Misery Moo. Do you know Misery Moo? Misery Moo is a story that starts off with once upon a time there was a miserable old cow. And we used to... We used to, 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 to share that story with our kids. We don't need to be like Misery Moo. In fact, what we need to do is go in there and say, I'm a culture changer. I carry the power and the authority of heaven. And I'm not here to be wound up by these guys. I'm here to release him right here, right now. And if it's a messy situation, then it needs to watch out because you're there to release the life-given power of Jesus. Okay? So every situation you find yourself in is not by accident. You are there to be a culture releaser and a culture changer. Amen. Okay. And as part of that whole restoration process of taking us out of the twilight zone, in the last 10 years, which is not a long time, the last, well, it's not a long time for me. If I'm looking at you again, I'm thinking some of you guys are pretty young, but it's not a long time. But in those years, God has restored prophecy to the church. God has restored healing to the church. He's released new models of evangelism. He's released a revelation back to the church that he wants to move and operate through ordinary people and not just the minister or the ministry team. And he's also radically changing the whole concept of what church is. Wow, that's a lot in 10 years. So what's next? What about the next 10 years? The next 20 years, the next 100 years? What does God want to, to do? Where does he want to take us? And how do we need to adjust and, and reposition to get there? And these are some of the things that I'm grappling with right now, and they're big questions. And that's why I'm beginning to get jig, bits of the jigsaw, and I'm beginning to get a, a sense of what that picture looks like. But I have to confess, I don't have it all together here today. But I know some of the things that he's doing. And I know there's more to follow. And I, I believe with all my heart, actually, more than ever before, um, that, that our nation lies on what can only be described as a spiritual knife edge. We exist in, in an absolutely pivotal moment in time where the future history of our nation depends on every single one of us. Because the scene's been set, the conditions are perfect for an incredible, not just revival, but reformation on our shores. And I want to show you something that might help convince you about that. I've got a map of Scotland and one of you bring it up, thank you. And I mentioned a few minutes ago that, that prophecy and healing and evangelism, different things have been restored to the church. So in that map on the right-hand side is what I would call a population density map. The little dark areas show pockets in the nation where a lot of people live together. And the lighter colored, lighter purple areas are, are where there's only maybe 20 people per mile, you know, that kind of thing. So that's a population density map on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side are where God has already raised up power-filled supernatural beings who know who they are, who know who their God is, and placed them strategically in the nation. Because it shows where the Light and Life outreach teams are, where the healing rooms teams are, where there's filling stations, there's schools of the supernatural, which you guys have one. And every single one of these teams, if you like, I used to have a background in business, and uh, I used to grow businesses and release them. That was part of what I did. And one of the questions that you, you think about when you've got a new business and you want to release it in the marketplace is what kind of growth strategy will I apply? Will I apply, apply a push strategy where I knock every door and I advertise like mad and people get to hear about it? Or do I model a prototype and people get to hear, you know, and they taste it and then they, they phone you up and they ask you to go and do a similar thing where they are? And that's what you call a pull strategy. So you can have a push strategy where you forcibly take it forward and you try very hard on your own steam to make it work. Or you have 
a pool strategy where you create something amazing and people get to hear about it and they come and ask for some. Yeah? So that map there, I, I know Robbie Morrison who heads up healing. I knew Stephen Anderson before that. And the, the very much the strategy that God's given me and Craig Mackay who does fill-in stations, etc. is all based on the pool strategy. None of us have ever knocked on a door. God has pulled this across the nation. God has strategically positioned people where he wants them to be in this nation. And if you look at that map, what that represents is thousands, thousands of spirit-filled, hungry people ready and desperate to see a nation changed for God. Isn't that amazing? Every single pocket where there's a high density, uh, population density, it has been targeted. Every single pocket where there's a lot of people has a team ready to take the nation. And the amazing thing is none of these areas existed 10 years ago. Most of them didn't exist four years ago. Wow. You know, I think if God ever had an orchestra, he'd be the greatest conductor in the world, <laughs> the universe, the galaxy, because he has things going on in the background that we know nothing about. And then suddenly he switches the light on and you think, oh my goodness, he's not been quiet. He's not been silent. He's been at work and he's been doing amazing things. And our nation really does sit on a knife edge today. And as I've been grappling and, and talking to God about this, um, what I've sensed him say is that that's only phase one. That's what I would call phase one of, of awakening people and positioning people. There's another phase to come. And um, Chris Vallotton touched on it in the summer. And when he was here, he said that he sensed in his spirit that the river of God was beginning to flow over Scotland. And he's right. Um, and when John Paul Jackson came a few years ago, he said something similar. He said he kept waking up in the middle of the night with a vision of Scotland <laughs> and the sense that Scotland was on the verge of something incredible. And the key that would show that God was about to move mightily in Scotland is when the government of Scotland had a prophetic penetration. So where the prophets of God were given a welcome into the place of parliament. And he was so excited about it. That, that's the, 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 the now message that he brought a couple of years ago. Now, most of you know, because I've told this story before, that we've, we took our first team of prophetic evangelists into Parliament in Scotland in December 2011. And, you know, each time we go in, we've gone every single year since, and we spend a week praying ministering to the MSPs. And each time we go, God does something greater and something more amazing. Two weeks ago, I met up with one of the key people who heads Parliament to pray for Scotland, and she said that Nicola Sturgeon has just agreed to come along and lead a time of prayer and reflection in our Scottish Parliament. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we live in days where the river of God is impacting our government. And, and some of you will remember another story that I've told before, here before of Carol, the social worker, who came along to one of our events and brought a friend who had neuralgia in her mouth. And it was such a bad condition that the only way to, to, to stop the pain was for her to have all her teeth removed. Do you remember that story? Yeah? And she took her friend along and guess what? God healed her instantly. Carol was so impacted by that that she one opened up areas in the, the social work uh, for us to go in and to minister to people who are addicts because she said these people don't need methadone anymore than need Jesus. And the second thing that happened was the woman who had neuralgia was a busybody. And she was well known, and in a good way, I don't mean a negative way, but she was really well known in, in her community. And people kept asking her what had happened. And they kept talking to her. And they kept saying, that's incredible. I need some of that. I know, I know someone who needs healed. And I need someone who needs touched. And before very long, they all came back to Carol and they said, we need you to organize something. So can you open up your home and a few of us will come along? I said, I don't know. So she phoned me up and she spoke to me about it. I said, sure, we can bring a small team to your home. But it didn't stop there. A few days before we were due to go, I got a phone call. Barbara, there's 80 people who want to come. I've had to book the golf club. Can you come there instead? Right. We live in days where one person has one encounter and a whole community gets impacted. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit has taken the very soil that we walk on and he's poured Holy Spirit fuel all over it. 
All it takes is one spark. And today, you're here to hear this message that I'm still just getting from the Holy Spirit because you're to be carriers of that fire. You're to be the sparks that will bring the one, stop for the one, bring them into encounter with Jesus and then be amazed at the ripple effects that follow on. That make sense? Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, you are a fire carrier of the living God. I just declare over you right now that every single one of you will leave a phenomenal legacy in God. Yeah? And, and, and I also declare over you that the best is yet to come. <laughs> That your fruitfulness, you may have had a very fruitful life up to now, but I declare over you that the best is yet to come and the best fruit is yet to be released from your lives, from your ministries, and through your families. Okay? Cool. Another wee outreach that we did um, was in a poor area of Glasgow. I don't know if I've told this one here before or not, but it was a typical summer's day. (laughs) The wind was just blowing and it was pouring and it was soaking and it was freezing and it was not unlike what it is most days this summer and this was a really tough outreach that we had to do in a really really tough area of Glasgow it was a kind of community where the kids drink iron brew with gravel in it just to toughen themselves up and and as we battled to put up our tents one of the roofs blew away do you know it was just one of those days where it was Murphy's Law all over it and we're trying to remain positive and enthusiastic and everything that could go wrong was going wrong and no offense to anyone if you were on team that day but we looked like we've all been dragged through a, a hedge backwards it was like halloween come early do you know we were just standing there dripping wet disheveled makeup everywhere <laughs> but you know these holy ghost goosebumps that you sometimes get when god's about to do something amazing we didn't have any <laughs> The only goosebumps we had were because we were freezing. <laughs> and thankfully, there was someone on the team who thought, let's pray. <laughs> what a good idea. <laughs> and she just said, Lord, help. <laughs> and that's a great prayer to pray because actually we serve an amazing God who can take every single one of our disappointments. When things start to go wrong, I guess, you know, we're almost conditioned to Again, go back into misery moo mentality, isn't it? Oh, it's all awful and we're doomed. When actually when things start to go wrong, it's like, oh, wow, God, you're really going to have to turn up now, isn't it? You know, we need to sort of change the way we start to see things. So she, she just prayed, Lord, help. And, and thankfully the rain stopped at that point. And we, we, we didn't have all of our gazebos because one of them was completely mashed up and you know, destroyed. But we did have two gazebos. And so we opened up what we had. And this wee family turned up at the door. And we're looking at them and they're looking at us. And, you know, they just came out of nosiness. What are you doing here? (laughs) Well, we are here to bless you guys. and, And, you know, if you want to know uh, things about your life and being encouraged, then we have people who can listen to the Spirit of Jesus and give you words of direction and stuff. All right. Right, aye, right. Uh, can I get some of that then? How much does it cost? It's free. All right, right, we'll give you some then. And you know, <laughs> as we prayed for her, the Holy Spirit released this revelation about our family and about the poverty trap they've been in for generations. And he said that this, this young girl had been given a good brain and that she was more than able to go to college and, and to get her qualifications and to do something amazing in her life and break that poverty trap of her family. So we shared that you know, over her life and she was absolutely stunned. And she said, I just paid 20 quid to a psychic last week and they'd never told me any of that stuff. But you know, I've just been accepted for a college course, but I didn't think I was good enough to do it. She was so impacted by, by God's word. She, right there and then, in that stinking place, she asked Jesus right into her life. And I, yeah, you can. 
And then, then she brought along this, this young lad called Ali. He was her son-in-law. And I don't know how old her, you know, a partner was or whatever, but, but Ali had broken his leg and he'd cast, he had a cast on right down his, his whole leg and he was in a lot of pain. And he says, Ali, can we pray for you? <sighs> I suppose if you want, aye, whatever, do you know? Yeah, absolutely no faith there at all. In fact, he was annoyed to have been dragged into this tent of weirdos, like something out of a, a Dracula movie. But anyway, so we, we prayed for him. Um, and you know what? He said, what are you doing to me? That's really weird. My leg feels really strange. How is the pain level? Eh, uh, doesn't seem to be there. <laughs> Would you like to, is there anything you can think you can do now that you couldn't do before? Eh, uh, don't know. I, I can walk. <laughs> hey, everybody, look at me. I can walk. <laughs> Ali also asked Jesus into his life, right there. Right there. In February just past there, uh, a beautiful Muslim family came all the way th- from Edinburgh because they'd heard that God was doing things in this little pub in, in, in Glasgow where we run our pit stop events. And this Muslim family would be getting dreams that were really bugging them and no one could interpret their dreams for them. So they came. They came in, and long story short, they got saved, right? <laughs> Two weeks ago, all four of them came to our training event in Glasgow so they could get trained up and join our teams. <laughs> and the, these are exciting, right? And I, I wanted to tell you some stories of what God's doing. But the reason I wanted to tell you such diverse ones like that is I want to declare over you and over your lives right now that no one is unreachable for God. Absolutely no one is unreachable. No one in your, your circle of friends, no one in your family, no one that you come into contact with is unreachable. Let's just declare that no one is unreachable to God. And there's so many more stories that, that, that I could share. Um, but I just want to declare that the river of God is start to flow over Scotland and wherever that river is flowing, people are getting saved, they're getting healed, they're getting delivered. Their lives are being put back together as well. And it's incredible. And we live in days where the, where the atmosphere around us is, is just so pregnant with potential. But the extent to, to which the river flows depends on us. Because God says in his word, John seven thirty eight. That he that believes in me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So God has chosen to release his river in us and through us, through ordinary people, like you and me. And wherever we choose to take it, that's where it's going to get released. It's not something we're going to wake up one morning and, wow, our country's in a revival. It's all been reformed and it's amazing and everybody loves Jesus. That'd be great. (laughs) And there's no sickness anymore. (laughs) That's not going to happen. Actually, the river of God is going to be released wherever we choose to take the river of God or wherever we choose to release the river of God. And God has strategically positioned every single one of you right where you are in your own spheres of influence so that you can be a conduit of heaven to these people. And that's really cool. So, all the stories that I've just told as well... um, they all happened when ordinary people like you and me did what Kevin Deadman said. They stepped over the chicken wire. They partnered with the Holy Spirit. And they just created a space for God to move. I love getting introduced. and I love coming here. And you're always so welcoming to me. And it's amazing to be told how amazing I am. Sometimes I sit there and I think, I've obviously come on the wrong day and there's another speaker. Because <laughs> I'm just an ordinary wee woman too. I'm first and foremost a mum. And I've got kids and a scabby cat that just won't die. Do you know what that is? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> she's about 20. <laughs> and she's very bad tempered. Anyway. Um, she just, but she lives in the glory. <laughs> okay, let's get it back on track. Turn to your neighbour and see. <laughs> I was created to operate in supernatural power and authority. (laughs) All right. The reason I put together the map that I showed you, you, can you put it back up again? Is that possible? Um, Is that 
for several months, I've been sensing this stirring in my spirit. I've been sensing a, a restlessness. And, and often when God's about to do something really big in the spiritual realm, that's the way that I get to discern it. You know, it's, it's like an alarm bell. It's like there's something just an unease in my spirit. And it's like it drives me to the place of, of God's face. And it drives me to seek him. And, and as I did that, um, what I've heard him say really clearly is that as a nation, we have transitioned from a season of awakening and positioning into possession and occupation. That's a major, major shift. Let me say that again. That as a nation, we have transitioned from a season of awakening and positioning into a time of possession and occupation. Huh. Wow. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there's many well-known prophets that have prophesied over Scotland about the importance of the season that we live in. People like Jean Darnell is probably the oldest one, John Paul Jackson, Chuck Pierce, Chris Vallotton, and many, many others. But prophetic words are not fait accomplis. They're not done deals. Prophetic words are promises that if we do what God says, will come to pass. We, they're, they're opportunities to partner with the Holy Spirit. They're opportunities to, to partner with the Holy Spirit and call that which is not into that which needs to be. Yeah, that's what prophetic words from God are. And so there are three keys that will help us in that whole transition from awakening and, and positioning into possession and occupying. And we have to be active in them. And, and the first key is found in Acts 5, 15. It says there, when Peter walked down the street, people would bring their sick so his shadow might fall on them and he'd be healed. Now, that's incredible. Peter didn't even need to, to pray for people. Does anyone else want that anointing? <laughs> he just had to walk by them and boom, they got healed. So key number one, get yourself a magic shadow. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. Peter didn't have a magic shadow. He simply learned how to host and release the presence of God. So, so key number one, learn to host God's presence even more. Learn to carry his presence and release his presence. And the, the level of yieldedness that Peter had didn't come from getting someone to pray for you. I mean, people ask me to pray for them for the most crazy things. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to pray for anyone for anything that's on their heart. But I cannot pray for you to have a fantastic friendship with God. I really can. I wish I could. I wish I could impart an intimacy impartation. But actually, friendship is something you develop. And I have many people that I know, and, but I only have a few really close friends. And they only get to become my really close friends as we hang out together. And, and as we have coffee together, and as we chat, and, and actually as they learn to see me on my bad days, but still love me through them. My God doesn't have bad days, thank goodness, but we do. And, and so it's the same thing. If you want to have a friendship with God, it's not enough just to turn up on a Sunday. It's not enough just to do devotions. These things are great, and we need to read the Bible, and we need to, to grow. But actually, we need to practice His presence wherever we are. Do you know, God has moods. He has opinions about things. I've got a little girl who, when she was very young, um, she was an absolute out-and-out -out extrovert, which is unfortunate for her because we're a family of introverts. You might think, there's Barbara speaking up the front. Barbara's actually very quiet. Um, you know, I really am. And this was my husband. And this was my, my son. But this little girl, Rachel, was like this explosion of life in our, in our, in our little family. And when she was young, she would wake up talking. I'm sure she probably talked in her sleep, actually. And, and anything she could find, whether it was dollies or a chair, if it was alive, even better, and if it was a human being, you weren't getting out of there. You know, she was just that kind of... And then she went through a kind of introvert stage herself, whether it just rubbed off on her. But these last, this last year, she's come back to being Rachel. <laughs> and I tell you, within about 10 minutes, my ears are sore. But I've got my sozo face on because I love her to bits and she's my daughter and I want her to flourish. But I'm thinking, oh God, if only he'd put an on off switch, that would have been so cool. <laughs> but I thank him that he doesn't. You know, do you hear me here? I love her to bits, right? Anyway, 
when I spend time with her, what do we do? She chats and she shares and she tells me about who she's seen at school. And she tells me about the things she's grappling with. And she even tells me about, you know, what God said to her and stuff. So we have this, we know each other really, really well. And occasionally, I'll say some words back. And so, <laughs> and she gets to know what's going on in my life too. But that's how you build relationship. It's by creating space to get to know each other. And so, whatever else you do, whatever, else, whatever takeaway you, you get from today, you need to know that friendship with God is real. We're not in a religion. We don't turn up at church and sing songs and get high or whatever. Do you know what? We, now that you do that here anyway, you've got an incredible sense of God's presence here. But we, we don't just go through the motions. If you're not practicing his presence when you leave here and when you go home and when you go to work, then let's raise the bar. Let's increase the challenge. So I want to challenge you. <laughs> Practice his presence wherever you're doing, whether it's the hoovering or cleaning the cat litter, if you've got one or whatever. Do you know, practice his presence, chat to him, ask him his opinion. What, what, what's God's favorite color? Does that sound heretical? I'm not going to tell you, but you can ask him. Do you know, these are the kind of things, conversations that you can have with him because he's real and he has moods and he has opinions about things. It's so easy to get caught up, particularly as a ministry leader. I mean, I'm leading Light and Life. Um, running a little church, got an amazing family. Life can get busy. And the thing I have to watch out for is I don't get so busy doing things that I forget to prioritize time with him. Have you ever been dumped by a friend? Didn't feel too good, did it? <laughs> and yet sometimes that's what we do with God, isn't it? We get so busy doing this for you, God. I'm so busy. I don't have time to speak to you. And actually, all he's looking for is our presence. And, and when you prioritize his presence, <laughs> you know, it takes you on the most incredible adventures as well as getting to know you. And um, the, the amount of fruitfulness that comes when you're in his presence is far surpasses anything that you can do by working hard. Yeah? And let me give you one little weird example, because um, I know you'll take it. <laughs> Um, a, few, a few months back, I met up with some friends. In fact, uh, yeah, it was Jan and, and uh, Jen were there. And we just got into the presence of God. And we, we went with no agenda. We just went to, to hang out together, put on some worship music, and then just got into God's presence. And, and he, he translated me in, in the spirit to, to heaven, first of all. And whenever you're, you're in that place, all you can feel is the holiness of God and the weightiness of God. And so without even having to think, I need to repent, suddenly you're like, God, I'm unclean, touch me right now, bring your cold. You know, it's that kind of moment where there's just such a weightiness of God. And then from that place, he took me to an ISIS camp in the Far East, in the spirit. And I'm, I'm in, the, in the spirit and I'm seeing everything that's going on. And I, I saw the guys with their guns and I saw the hostages that they had. And God said, go up to them. He led me to go up to one of them and put my hand over his heart. And as I did that, he gave me a black stone to remove from his, ha his heart. And then it was the next day, the day after, there were, there were all sorts of stories on Facebook and on an, an in, an the internet about how some of the ISIS guys were coming to Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that I led that person to Jesus, but what I'm telling you is that in his presence, he showed me another way to warfare. And if he's shown that to me, he's shown that to others. But the fruitfulness of that is incredible. So, key number one, pursue the presence of God. John Bevere once said that 80% of Christians have acquired a knowledge of God through other people's concepts and revelation. Mm. You know, as a church, we have a chance to blow these statistics right out of the water. To become a nation of people, well, people and a nation, <laughs> of people who truly know God who are really his friends, and who, who learn how to be yielded and filled with the Holy Spirit. Key number two, when the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant, you know, when, when Israel were in the wilderness, and they were coming out of that wilderness to possess the land God had given them, um, the priests had to go first. And, and they had to carry the Ark of the Covenant with them, and the people would follow. Um, <laughs> 
And I love that picture because, as you probably know, that the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. But the priest could only carry the presence of God forward when they marched in step, when they did it together. Because if they were pulling in different directions, then obviously they weren't going to go anywhere. And each priest uh, wore a breastplate that had 12 stones, or gems, gemstones. And each gemstone represented a tribe of Israel. None were left out. And none were preferred. And so in that beautiful picture of of going from the wilderness to take the promised land, God's saying, do it in unity. And every single one of you are part of it. No one is preferred and no one is left out. And so I want to encourage you both individually and as a church. There's a great sense of God's presence here. There are some churches in this city who don't experience what you have. You are very blessed. You have a great leadership team. You have an open dialogue with the Holy Spirit. This is a very, very blessed place. Not all the churches in the city are in that place. So your job is to walk alongside them. Your job is to encourage them to come on this journey of seeing a nation transformed too, to do it together. Because what the enemy would like to do, and I'm not saying he's doing this here at all, but the, the strategy of the enemies is, is that people is to keep us divided. Yeah? Particularly in Scotland. Because for hundreds and hundreds of years, what, what did our Scottish clans do? They fought each other. And they raided each other's camp, didn't we? And we'd steal each other's sheep. And we'd compete against each other. And so much of church history in this land echoes that behavior. Can we agree that it stops? Can we be the agents of change that God has called us to be? And can we do exactly what you were talking about? Danny Silk's going to come and teach you. Keep our love on. If people behave in a dishonorable way towards us, our response needs to be an honorable kingdom response right back. Yeah? Let us press in together to move forward as the greater body in this nation. Okay? And um, some of the things that we probably all know all these, you know, some of the accusations that different parts of the body will give to each other. You're not as free as us. And you're not as grounded as us. And you're not spiritual enough. And you're not caring enough. You're too strict. You're too liberal. You're wacky. You're boring. You laugh too much. You've swallowed a bag of lemons. We're more prophetic than you. Was that prophetic or pathetic? Uh, Still loving me? (laughs) These are just some of the things that the enemy brings up and highlights what he perceives to be differences so that we can stay divided and we can contrast. God forgive us. (laughs) Einstein once said it's, it's a very small mind that can only think of one way to spell a word. Do you know, it's a very small mind that can only think of one way to do church or to worship or to disciple people. And Satan is absolutely terrified of what will happen if we really start embracing each other. If we really start loving and really start honoring each other. Because when we do, we might just become that unstoppable army. <laughs> Releasing an unstoppable river of God, of his love, his power, and his glory over our nations. Amen? Amen. Key three. Get a Nike anointing and just do it. (laughs) (laughs) And as the harvest intensifies, you know, God is looking for people who say, here I am, God, use me. And yet, if you're anything like me, sometimes there are moments when it's, here I am, God, use Phil. (laughs) Or, Here I am, God, use Jen. (laughs) Or use the dog. (laughs) Anyone else ever feel that way? (laughs) But going back to Joshua for a moment, Joshua 1, 3, when God told Joshua to take the land, he also gave him a promise. And he said to Joshua, Joshua, every place that your foot goes on or walks on, I will give you. I have already given you, actually. 
So let me say that again. Every place the sole of your foot will tread, I have already given to you. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, every place the foot of your soul will tread, God has already given you. Do you know, that's an amazing promise. But it's conditional. Because we can only take possession of the land we're willing to walk on. We'll only see people healed if we're willing to pray for them. We'll only see people saved if we're willing to share the gospel with them. And when the Israelites crossed over the promised land, it was only as the priest actually put their foot in the River Jordan that it stopped flowing. I wonder how they felt. <laughs> this whole nation of people behind them and they're up front. Wouldn't it be nice if God had given him a sign that the river was going to stop? Are you sure this is right, God? But it was only as they put their foot in the river that it stopped flowing. And it's only as we put put our feet in the land that God's given to us that we'll see his river flow through us. We have to take the river. We have to actually partner with the Holy Spirit in all of that. When we started Light and Life, which was back in August 2007... We didn't really know what we were doing at all, I have to confess to you. In fact, we were pretty clueless. We didn't even know if anyone would turn up. I take it that's the kids and not me. Okay. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> um, but when we opened the doors of this little pub in Troon, then a whole bunch of people just came right in and they encountered God. And one of them was a girl called Gemma. And Gemma came with a back injury that had plagued her for years. And as her healing team prayed for her, she, held, she felt this heat going right through her body. And her, her pain completely disappeared. And she couldn't believe it. She was like, I can't believe it. My pain's gone. And we couldn't believe it either. We were like, are you sure? Do you want to test that again? Are you sure? <laughs> you know, she was our first visitor to ask for healing on her first night. And Jesus turned up, you know, big style. The fact that we were wet behind the ears and clueless probably just added to his joy actually. So turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're clueless. No, don't. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> I had to get in there fast, didn't I? You were going to do it. Um, <laughs> just repeat, every place you set your foot, God has already given you. Okay, so our nation has transitioned from a season of awakening and positioning into possession and occupation. And God wants to partner with every single one of us to see his river released in the spheres of influence that he's placed us in. We're not there by accident. It's not haphazard. It wasn't a random thing. God has given you everything you need to see his power and his presence flow through you to impact those that you rub shoulders with. And just to close, I'll close in a minute, um, some of the barriers that, that can hold us back are things like disappointment or discouragement or thinking we're not good enough. And just in closing, I want to take these giants down. Is that okay? Are we okay for time here? A few minutes? Okay. Let's start with discouragement and disappointment and fear. Every one of the testimonies that I shared with you earlier could have ended very differently because every single one of them had obstacles and giants to overcome. For example, at Parliament, um, particularly the first time that we went, but actually every time we go, there's that fear of these are really important people. What if I pray for them and nothing happens? Or what if I give them a, a word of prophecy and they just laugh and say that's nonsense? You know, there's that, that giant of fear that we have to overcome uh, to be able to, uh, to minister to these guys. But here's the good news. Jesus said to us, go and do, right? The rest is up to him. So if we turn up 
and we offer to release healing and we offer to pray for people, then our job's already done. We've already been successful. Yeah? Okay. And King David had to face the fear of man too. Um, when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Jerusalem, you can read about it in 2 Samuel 6, he got so excited. You maybe know the story. He was so carried away with these dance moves and he started grooving about in his underwear. Do you know the story? And his wife, Miko, says to him, Hey, Davy, you look, you look a right wally prancing about in your knickers. And he turns around and he says, Darling, I'll become an even bigger wally than this. And how many times have we allowed the giant of fear and of what other people think of us to stop us doing what God's called us to do? So let's just declare, if required, I'll become an even bigger wally than this. Come on, let's declare, if required, I'll become an even bigger wally than this. Here's another one. I am no longer a slave to fear. Okay. We serve a God who can take our biggest disappointments and turn them into the back door of our destiny. And he does that all the time. So in closing, if you want to be one who says, here I am, God, use me. If you want to be one who has a fresh fire and a fresh anointing to carry and release his river into the spheres of influence that he's called you to, do you want to stand for a moment and I'll pray for you? God, I want to thank you for everyone in this room. I thank you for everyone that's that said, here I am, God, use me. And I thank you that you've allowed us to be alive in such strategic times for our nation. Thank you that you've positioned each one of us into the spheres of influence that you want to impact through our lives. Thank you that we don't need to strive to do that. We simply need to host you and turn up. <laughs> and so God, right now, in Jesus' name, I'd ask that your Holy Spirit would intensify an even greater fire in our bellies. God, that you would take down every single mindset that would get in the way of us hearing you. Every single mindset that would distract us or prevent us from doing what you've called us to do. Right now, in Jesus' name. And in place of these mindsets, God, I ask for a greater release of your Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom and truth and revelation. And I want to impart to this group right now. Everything that you've given to me of the gift of prophecy, of the word of knowledge, gift of discernment, and of the gift of healing, God. So that as they go, that, that their anointing can, can be mixed with mine. And as they go, that they can see your kingdom unleashed with incredible power and incredible force wherever you place them. In Jesus' name, amen.